All right, welcome to book club. My name is Des. This week, hi we're book on... club. Hi book club. Oh wow. We're on section two, part one of The Way of Zen by Alan Watts. Uh, section one is called Empty and Marvelous. Did anyone get to read the book? <laughs> I've read every book. Mm. I don't even know what we're talking about. <laughs> awesome. I, I must admit I read it, but I, I probably didn't give it what it deserved. That's fine. So I, I hope you'll help me digest it. Uh, the primary thing you need to know, you so, know so, is that we're talking about Zen. <laughs> Thanks. I'll grab my, I'll grab my in-person copy of the book. I'm not surprised you have one. In the yeah. Sli in the slightest. Um. <laughs> <laughs> um, for those of you who do not have a copy before you, or are uninterested in finding your copy, I am screen sharing to Discord. Oh, you are for your convenience. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That is useful. Yeah, some people find it useful. Um, I don't see it though. I if you, see it. If you hover or click my name, there should be a button that says watch or join stream. No, or I know. I, I, I just figured it out. Yeah. I feel old. That's fine. <laughs> it's actually a fairly new Discord feature. Um, They've only implemented it, I think, in the last two years. Year yeah. and a half, maybe. I don't know. I was really excited. I was like, this is everything I wanted. No, I'm thinking of something else. Oh, 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 no. This has been around the whole time. Screen sharing has. What they finally implemented in the last year and a half was being able to watch multiple streams at once. So if everybody in your channel is sharing a screen or something, you can look at all of them at once. Oh. Yeah. They upgraded the feature. That's what I'm thinking about. Sorry. My bad. Anyway, uh, to get started, uh, we are in, we are first brought this lovely Zen poem. Sorry, do I have to move somewhere where there are no crows? <laughs> <laughs> I'll be back. Okay. Okay, we're here. Yeah. <laughs> Yay. The perfect. It should be better. The perfect way is without difficulty. That's true. Sam, may I? kindly request that you uh, mute your mic when you're not talking. I don't know what you're clicking, but it's like... Oh, sorry. My mouse is incredibly loud. Yeah. <laughs> it's like uh... so loud. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh... um, let me leave this big view. Do that. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, it's just like... Maybe push to talk will work. Yeah. Yeah, that's the way. Yeah. Push to talk's nice. Sam's got an incredibly uh, effective a... microphone, and I don't know why. I don't know either. <laughs> I mean, it sounds really satisfying, whatever you're clicking. Like, I want to click it. <laughs> but, <laughs> like, I want to just, like, it just seems like one of those mice that would just be like, <laughs> you just want to feel that click, right? It would be very tactically satisfying. However, that sweet haptic feedback. Haptic feedback, yes. Yes. <laughs> um,. Yes, and so... All right, it should be good now. All right, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Come here, Doc. Yes. <laughs> my my Wi-Fi freaked out. I'm good now. <laughs> Hooray! Um, anyway, the perfect way is without difficulty. Uh, I think Alan did a really good job this chapter of kind of breaking down Zen, but I also might be biased in that I kind of had an amount of understanding of Zen already, and so that primed me to read the chapter. Um, because he does, he's still, like, very some parts are unavoidably using the, like, language of Zen still, because that's the limitation of words. <laughs> Ain't it the truth? Uh, but overall, I thought he did a great job of breaking it down very plainly. Uh, I was very surprised to see the translation of that poem because it's very different to the one I'm familiar with. Hmm. But mm -hmm. I recognized it, so I was like, wow, you can actually translate it different ways. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> see? Well, it's and a... this translation would be older than probably... 
I, I, I may, I'm making an assumption here, and that it might be older than the one you're read, reading or referring to, but, and I wonder if any new linguistic information came out in between the translations or vice versa, even. Anyway. Mm -hmm. To see this is to see that good without evil is like up without down. <laughs> I liked that phrase. <laughs> um, you didn't even read the good poem. I didn't read the good poem. I just really liked the phrase that I highlighted. Uh... <laughs> I just like that phrase. Overall, though, um, the poems do a pretty good job. Blah, blah, blah. I'm going to skip actually the next page because there's something I think is a little more talkable, I guess. Um... And so Alan begins to talk about that Zen is this liberation from the pattern of understanding the absurdity of making choices. And um... <laughs> oh my goodness. I wish you'd all read the chapter. <laughs> I've, I'm, I'm reading it right now, Dennis. If right now. <laughs> right now I'm reading it. I'm I read reading it. it. I read it like th three years ago. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so I, I like how he puts getting the feel in quotes. <laughs> like He's like, this is a hip thing the kids say. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> it's that 50 years ago, right? Yeah. More. More. Oh wow. Okay. And and then he likens approaching something from the outside, like a pie or a barrel of beer. Wow. <laughs> like oh yeah, <that> Alan. <laughs> to succeed. Yeah, that metaphor kind of misses the mark, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah, I was like, this is not your strongest metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> I understood it, <laughs> but it wasn't that good. Um, to succeed is always to fail in the sense that the more one succeeds in anything, the greater is the need to go on succeeding. To eat is to survive, to be hungry. Um, and I know I've personally felt this, and Alan goes into it, but this kind of way of thinking can feel very um, defeatist. It can feel very like, well, what's the point? I guess I'll just die. <laughs> Especially if you're productivity-based and you think, well, there's yeah. no yield here it's just an ongoing state mm -hmm. but that's silly it's not silly it's true <laughs> it's an ongoing state yeah no 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 the, not... the silly part is the expectation yeah. of uh productivity yeah ah uh, yes one of my my kryptonites <laughs> yes. capitalist thinking yeah still have productivity you just achieve it without doing mm -hmm. yeah so and, and the chapter together. definitely gets into that i think uh but he does start out by discussing the need that contrast creates this sense of better right of uh, uh he uses this metaphor of sleeping on a hard bed of some kind i imagined a plank of wood because why not and uh how turning on one side to the other only feels like a better position in contrast to the last one in the growing discomfort that it had. I thought that hmm. was interesting. And yeah, then... He had a... hmm? yeah. That was a good one about the fleece, but I guess it's later. Um, yes. Yeah, it's a little bit that was, later. That was brutal. Um, and then by... We've improved the circumstances. Okay, I'm going to get a new bed. Bam! I got a new bed! Perfect. Now I don't have to keep turning or something. And then suddenly you realize the air in here is really still. I could use a fan. <laughs> and right. so just because you've eliminated one issue doesn't mean there's not another one that's going to you're going to realize this is also an issue. <laughs> to receive trouble is to receive good fortune. To receive agreement is to receive opposition. Um, and I like that he lays this foundation of contrast and these things exist because the other one does. Um, mm -hmm. Hot exists because you've been cold. 
and cold exists because you've been hot. <laughs> yeah, you, I kind of do it the other way around. I give opposition mm -hmm. as a form of agreement. Mm. I think that's 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 like more positive way of doing it. But if you have positive, you have negative. <laughs> yes, that's true. That's true. It's equally positive and negative. No, as, it's neither. As, no, as long as it's both. No, it's as neither, long... not both, nor neither, nor both. <laughs> yes. As long as the reception is what is intended, then I think, well done. That's how I feel um, about language. <laughs> but yeah. Um, then he gets into, like, you know, it's not meant to be futile. So, um, Max, tell me mm. some of your emotions or your thoughts or your commentary on uh, the futility of eating when you're just going to be hungry again. The point of eating isn't to never have to eat again and be done with it. The point of eating is to eat. I mean, flavors exist, so you can enjoy those. The feel of the food in your mouth can be good, so long as you've cooked something well and it's actually food. Uh, it can be a quite enjoyable experience. It could also be quite negative. It could be mm -hmm. neutral. Um, it really all depends on your subjective experience. But to get past all of that and say, well, I shouldn't bother eating because I'm just going to have to do it again, is like saying, why would I ever bathe? I'm just going to get dirty. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness my brain don't do it <laughs> <laughs> I was about to go on a tangent about what happens if you don't bathe <laughs> regularly no 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 Let, let's not go on the tangent no. <laughs> uh, it won't be any more disturbing than what you said earlier Bella <laughs> taking care of yourself but the basics is a form of self love <laughs> Um, and then I think the chapter starts to get into what I, in my brain, absolutely attach to the core of Zen when I start to think about Zen as a practice, um, and kind of the thoughts that I tend to have around it, um, of the, I, and I highlighted it here where the sweating is the heat. <laughs> Or um, yeah. that, that if it, he doesn't use this phrase, but thou art that, um, is a common phrase that I've heard. That thou art tat tvam asi. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I don't know if you've noticed, but my brain t brain just simplifies things to the most memorable thing it can, and then dumps everything else. <laughs> That's, fair. That's that ADHD like, brain. Uh, no. I had a really bizarre experience because as I was reading this chapter, I was also reading uh, a book on statistics, which actually said the same thing mm -hmm. about like causality and association. I was like, wow, this is Zen and they don't even know that. So it was pretty cool. Most things are Zen and people don't like pick up on that unless mm -hmm. they're also Zen. Mm -hmm. But then we start distinguishing between Zen and not Zen, and that's not very Zen of us. Or is it? <laughs> or is it? Dun dun dun! <laughs> True. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I really like this because I've heard this metaphor before about the moon in the water, and I like. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a really good one. Um, and I think it only, it's funny, uh, how this, <laughs> it's funny how you think you've understood something and you continually feel like you've learned a new level about it, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Like a new layer has been shaved off and you're like, oh, now I get it. And then next time you're like, oh, now I get it. <laughs> <laughs> now I really now get I it. Now I really get it and so i even had that while reading this chapter about and, and going over <laughs> alan's uh metaphor about the moon in the water and then i felt like even though i thought i understood it before i absolutely felt like i got a new layer of understanding shape you know just had more of the illusion shaved off <laughs> that's part of why uh you know some enlightened masters have said 
uh, practice doesn't end once you become enlightened. <laughs> you just keep doing it. That's that's why just... you became enlightened. Yeah. When the moon rises, the water does not wait to receive its image. And when even the tiniest drop of water is poured out, the moon does not wait to cast its reflection. For the moon does not intend to cast its reflection. The water does not receive its image on purpose. And this was... That, yeah. <laughs> that's that Wu Wei stuff. Yeah. I think I read it somewhere, but it was like with ducks or something. With ducks? <laughs> oh, yes. A yeah. duck flying in the sky leaves no trail uh, leaves no trail in the pond that's reflecting it right right yes maybe it was swan let's say it was swan that would be that would be better you so, can't yeah. you can't put a nail into the sky mm. sky nails You said that, and I wanted to follow up with the DuckTales theme. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> DuckTales. <laughs> That's the one. <laughs> oh, goodness. Uh, <laughs> what are the lyrics to that? I forget it. I'm so focused, I promise. Uh, <laughs> We're I all focused. Your lyrics and you don't want that. Um, but yeah, so like... Anyway, reading this section, I, I had, like, a moment of, like, huh. Uh... <laughs> so, I encourage everyone to stare at this section until you share in my revelation. Anyway. <laughs> uh, the subject creates the object just as much as the object creates the subject. Um, was an I felt like a really nice little summary sentence of what happens between that other chunk that I highlighted and this chunk. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is the unfortunate pattern in which I tend to read these books. Uh, is I'm like, all right, I get it. Okay, oh, that really summarizes everything, Alan. Why did you waste my time with these other three paragraphs? <laughs> <laughs> You just have to repeat it over and over from all the different angles and something. Yeah, I think that's what can feel different difficult. Things. I'm sorry. What? No different things. What might stick with different people based on their subjective experience? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. But you know, like, I was actually thinking about like all these like non dualities and stuff like. Uh, when you're thinking about like detox or those mm -hmm. sort of things, like if you try to get rid of something, how can you possibly get rid of something? Right? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, like if there's a spill, you use like a sponge or something and it absorbs it. And then you move it away <laughs> and then you squeeze it somewhere else. You don't get rid of it. You just kind of move it. Mm -hmm. Right. So yeah, you need to have an, an inside sponge to get your insides and then move them outside of you. And then where does it go? In I don't the know. Toilet, the usually. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I'm not talking about that. <laughs> your kidneys are kind of your. I don't, I don't know if you know much about anatomy, but your kidneys are actually like your inside sponge. <laughs> Tell me more about kidneys. I was Dad. talking <laughs> about into something. I was talking about <laughs> negative emotions, not not something you can urinate. Well, those right? are like toxins in your blood, right? <laughs> negative emotions are just like that. <laughs> Yeah, you know the, de brain. the depression molecule? Yeah. 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 It feels okay. like that sometimes, I'll, I'll though. Out, <laughs> we love you, Mbala. We're just done. No. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're idiots. Ignore us. <laughs> no. And I have a bad habit of reflecting people I'm talking to. So, like... <laughs> huh? What do you mean I... reflecting? <laughs> if I ever deviate away from, here's a serious like chat about this Jess and I just go off the fucking rails <laughs> I just I um I kind of think of myself I, I don't know I don't concretely mean to do this but I've thought about it sort of like um an amplifier I take whatever energy someone else is giving out and I just like all right let's crank this baby up to 11 <laughs> <laughs> Like, if you're chill and you're calm and we're talking academia, then I'm chill and calm and I'm going deeper in the academia. If you're like, it's chaos absurd time, I'm like, hell yeah, chaos absurd time! <laughs> you know? You know, that would be useful for mindfulness. Uh, it's 
interesting. It can be, and it can also be bad for it because I can get lost in it, in that energy. And no, for... I mean for mindfulness of other people, not yours. Oh yeah, I was like, no, it could be really bad for me. <laughs> nah, bro, nah, <laughs> nah. <laughs> no, if yeah, if you were like really wanting to be mindful of the energy you're putting out for other people, absolutely. <laughs> Especially if you're talking to somebody who does what I do and they feel like a mirror more than a, than an image. <laughs> mirror. That sounds zen. I think there's <laughs> zen something about mirror. Yeah. Mirrors are oh, interesting. Polishing your mirror, all that stuff, yeah. Oh, that's the water. Yeah. They just didn't have mirrors. Yeah, of course. Water is uh, more was more readily accessible Ugh. to the layman for many, many centuries <laughs> than a mirror. Uh, a complete derailment... Um, the mirror, you know, like water has two qualities, right? Like it mirrors stuff and also you can drink it. Mm -hmm. And it's wet. Currently, emus have these like conflated in their head. So if they see themselves in a mirror, they try to drink it. That's good. It, and it's, I just found it quite interesting that like they don't, that's a single concept for them. Interesting. Like, fantastic. <laughs> if I park the car out, like I'll get an emu eventually trying to drink the, the rear view mirror. But, Oh goodness! So, so he's it just seems smashing like... his face into the. No, no, no. Well, they, they kind of like grab it in their beak, and they kind of move their head upwards, so the water like rolls down into their beak, and yeah. they just keep doing that. I think that's a fascinating look into like a level of intelligence. Like at first, you're like, "Ha, ah, it's so dumb. Why are you trying to drink the mirror?" But like on some level, they're recognizing like that's me. I just only no, see no, no, me no, no, when no. I'm looking at water. <laughs> Maybe I think you're giving them a lot of credit. I but... don't know. My cat doesn't try to drink the mirror. He thinks it's another cat fun. moving yeah. in on his territory. <laughs> <That's fair. laughs> it's I maybe I, I, what you're saying. I like it looks incredibly dumb, but there is a little bit of wisdom to that. I think there's a spark of understanding of what's going on. They just can't perceive yeah. a this is an undrinkable reflective surface. I just think it's yeah. a very efficient use of a minimal amount of brain space. It's like, you know what? We know what reflections are. We're going to say that's water. Yeah. All right, moving on. Moving on. <laughs> and this is water. And you know what? You, you, you can't go wrong with drinking, right? Mm -hmm. like, <laughs> if there's nothing, you're just making drinking motions. Right. It won't harm you. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Oh, yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> Emus, new mascot of book club. Um... <laughs> I was never created. I was the cosmos. No individual Mr. Sasaki existed. Uh, Alan talks about the Zen master. Soke on Sasaki. Sasaki. Words. Vaguely that... Japanese words. Um, yeah. Is that the, the... What's your original face before you were born? Before your parents were born? Is, is that what, what that is? Or is it something else? It is very related. Um, in the okay. previous page, there was there was a highlighted thing saying that uh, it's incredibly clear that I am no less than all of existence or something like that. I have no other self than the totality of things of which I am aware. Um, so right. that's a really good point to go back to of this idea that your awareness of things absolutely dictates your perception of your experiences. Um and your you. And your you. <laughs> well, I thought the self includes things of which you are even not aware. Mm -hmm. But that's not your self concept. Mm -hmm. Oh, the self. Okay, okay, okay. He uses the the actual the the fake self. Okay. Yeah. No, Alan's absolutely going self. into this discussion of self and what that means and trying. It's really interesting. <laughs> it's like I'm. I just. I have a hard time. I'm having a difficult time today. Unraveling my thought process. Yes, I am. Yes, I didn't notice. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah, you know, so good at faking it. <laughs> that's wonderful because that's exactly the problem, right? Mm -hmm. The thoughts, your dualistic rational thoughts, right? This feels like more like a cognitive hiccup than a than an existential one. Yeah. A cognitive hiccup. <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll think about it later. You're trying to get rid of the subjective distinction between me and my experience and seeing these things as separate things. <laughs> mm. um, once again, thou art that. 
<laughs> um, and that concept, I, I wish, I almost wish I hadn't learned that stupid concept, like that, just that phrase or that whole like thought before reading this chapter. Yeah. Because I think that it would have helped to not have it in my mind. You know what I mean? It, it, it is providing what Alan would call a kind of blocking. Mm -hmm. where, where it just, you, you see a concept and you immediately say, oh, it's this one. And then you don't see the full depth of the concept because your idea got in the way. Right. So that I would say that made it really difficult to read through this chapter. As I kept mm -hmm. coming up with that in my mind. You need to work on beginner's <laughs> mind. <laughs> For sure. Just That's get amnesia right? test. Just get it. No, yeah. you're right. You're right. I poke fun, but you're right. <laughs> you're right. Do it. <laughs> Do it. There was something here that I was gonna... I was never created. I was the cosmos. No individual Mr. Sasaki existed. I think... Like, it's very easy to hear that sentence and say, yeah, that sounds deep, and then move on with your life. Mm-hmm. But, like, this this builds with everything else that's being said here. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's it's so easy for us to create and not even know that it has created an idea of who am I, what is the world, what is everything else. Mm -hmm. um, and to think that those are accurate representations, that we aren't in any way missing the point or perhaps seeing only partially of the picture, we think, without questioning, that we've got it all figured out, including, who am I? Mm -hmm. And this whole chapter is just being like, you silly buffoon, this isn't you at all, that's just your idea of you, and your idea of you isn't even your idea of you, you just haven't challenged this ever in your life. <laughs> Wait, so if it's not my idea, whose idea is it? Oh, no, no. Oh, okay. there, isn't, there isn't a who, is the point. <laughs> oh, okay, of course, yes. Yeah, of course, of course, of course, yes. There never is one. So this line oh, yeah. of, like, I was never created, I was the cosmos. That is the whole show. They're giving it away for free. Mm -hmm. But no one's going to understand that without putting in the first, you know, preliminary bang your head on the wall kind of work. Then you realize I don't need to do this anymore. And then you could see that and be like, Ooh, oh, it makes yeah. sense. Just like the flipping over. It's less comfortable. So let me get more comfortable. Well, you have to be less comfortable to recognize more comfortable. You have to be more confused to recognize less confused. And if you mm -hmm. don't know that you're more confused, you'll never know there is a less confused. You think you're, you're fine. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Zen, this book, all of it's just like, let's, let's twist you up into a bigger, tighter knot real quick. And then See? you'll realize mm -hmm. that that's actually happening. And then we can untie the knot and you'll feel so much better. <laughs> See, you know, the, the problem is like when I read, I was never created, I was the cosmos. I get it. I get it perfectly, purely rationally. Oh, right? no, like, the internet I, will, I will tell you about like cause and effect and how you can't define a boundary and how you can trace the causes and effects like all the way back. Hello? Right? And Hello? so that's the rational explanation of it. What? We what? can hear what? you. you. You can't hear me? You can't hear me. It sounds like Max might be having a little you. internet glitch. Huh? Oh, can you? Oh, yeah, he just... Yeah. They'll be back in a minute. He's back. Well, well, anyway, so, so what I was saying is like, like I can tackle it completely rationally, but I, I have a feeling that probably misses the point because if you could just do it rationally, then, then everybody would just do it and you'd be done, right? So there's clearly more to it. Do you see what I mean? There we go. My headphones oh, okay. for a Great. second. Ah. What I miss? Everything. We uh, actually it. are all now perfectly enlightened. Well, hey. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just well said to do without and... you. Yeah. <laughs> and anyway, so 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 where's the where's the error? Error. Okay, so I was saying if I can say that everything has causes and effects, right? 
And so I cannot say where's the boundary between me and where I start because there's always was a cause and the cause is an effect and has a previous cause. And I can just go through the chain forever, like right. till the big bang, right? Therefore, I was never created. I was the cosmos. Right. That's a perfectly rational explanation of this. Yep. W what does it miss? What it misses, I mean, it doesn't necessarily miss anything. It's just that that is a very externalized view of the self in terms of, like, true recognition. It's a very good physics answer for what is the self, though. And I think that has a great deal of importance because you've at least got something to point to if someone who has no understanding of this is like, well, what do you mean? Okay, well, you can look at the interrelatedness of all things, interactions, whatever. You can say that it all goes back to the Big Bang. Therefore, we are an extremity coming from the Big Bang, all of us at the same time. Mm -hmm. And that's all true. The problem with it is that it doesn't really, it, it lacks a punch. You know, it doesn't get in there and really make you reconsider your own idea of what's going on. It just says, yeah, okay, I can see how that would work on an intellectual yeah. level. We will move through the world. I see. It, it, it's not potent. Like, it, it doesn't shake you. Right. It's, right. it's still true, though. It's just not, like, you know, that deep true. Right. Where, where you look at it and you, like, kind of cry a bit, little bit and say, wow. So the deep truth is also an emotional reaction and a physical reaction? Yes. Okay. Um, there's, there's got to be an intellectual understanding of it, but there's also got to be some sort of like deep recognition. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Because I can tell you this and tomorrow you'll be, you'll have forgotten. Right. And you'll never remember and you'll just live as always. And yeah. That's part of why there's that whole um, tie you up in a knot part, because it's, again, the contrast of, like, this realization has untied all of this stress and fear and confusion into a placid, peaceful joy. And that transition being coupled with a realization makes it so much more potent than just the realization on its own. True. Yeah, because that's a feeling that stay, stays with you, mm -hmm. which is kind of colors all your all your life. And it also lends it um, a touch of validation because we've got this this tendency to associate things that happen together as being related. In this case, they are, so it works for us. Um, but you know, you feel better and you realize something. Therefore, the realization made you feel better. You know, I'm realizing maybe one could create enlightenment device. Like it would be this little spider that would just crawl over your body and it would poke you with a needle. <laughs> Basically constantly reminding you. Right? That would achieve the same effect, no? I mean, if you understand, it, it's got to have a psychological component. Right. So maybe if it like sang to you mysterious songs while it jabbed you with a needle. <laughs> I see you know this. Yeah, that's perfect. There we, there we go. We're gonna start a business empire together, and we're gonna make everyone enlightened in the process. Materious singing spires. Oh, that's good. Yeah, yeah. Mysterious. That's it. Yeah. Oh, here's the geese. Mm -hmm. They are not dogs. They are geese. Okay. And. That makes me feel better. Unnecessarily violent Zen masters. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah, those are a thing. <laughs> I don't know why they get like that, man. Come on. It's really wild to me sometimes. I'm like, why? Why are you doing? I mean, I no, get it I... on like a on like a, a philosophical level, right? No, 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 <laughs> no. I don't think I don't think this is really okay. So. What I think is happening, Zen masters use whatever method at their disposal to help you get enlightened. And one oh, of them wait. is hitting you, right? Yeah, in this case, I see why they did it. I get it now. Right. It's, it, I... it's the suddenness, yeah. the intensity. Yeah. It's like what we were saying earlier is the, the transition. But what, what I'm trying to get at is, so... I don't know, like they can violent. just as effectively suddenly screech like a banshee. Like, you know what I mean? Right. <laughs> 
But but that's what sticks in mind, right? And so that's what gets transferred over the centuries. That's fair. And so in the in the retrospect, it looks like like all those in Masters were these savage beasts who just like were screaming and hitting people, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> but I think that's this like bias. That's this selective process. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Uh... Yeah, those those times when they screamed and someone was like, oh, I get it now. Mm -hmm. Those times are passed down, whereas all the other times they screamed and someone was like, man, you should, you should stop screaming. Stop no screaming, one wrote yo. that part down. Exactly. <laughs> oh, we're perfectly normal, all right? <laughs> like, yo, dog, we're just trying to make dinner right now. <laughs> <laughs> You're waking up the baby. Right. Yeah. The Zen baby. <laughs> the Zen baby. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness gracious um do 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 that one um then this part was about that's right Des. <laughs> so i want so these two paragraphs before this are important but i'm having a really difficult time figuring out what i would say about them so i'm going to skip to this next paragraph about the gnat <laughs> that for the rescue yeah um and that the subjective experience of the amount of time we have f in comparison to creatures who maybe don't consider these things versus humans who have like a, 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 anywhere between like 60 to 90 year lifespan expectancy, right? Um, he says 60 to 70 and I've met too many like 90 year olds to... <laughs> Mm. Not not count them in. Um, and that. Well, they're talking about average lifespan. Av yeah, average lifespan, sixty to seventy-five or something. Um, and how perfectly human all of this is to consider these things and be like, it's not not enough time. Um, the paragraph preceding this mm -hmm. um, illustrates how we correlate time with productivity or goodness depending ah, yes 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 That's so the more time it. we have the better it is because then we can do more things and or experience more happiness slash joy mm -hmm. therefore the longer life is the better one because it can have more entertainment or productivity or whatever good thing we measure life by yeah but yeah as as they're saying this length of life first is uh based on perspective mm -hmm. it's not it's not static it's definitely something that can be changed if you've ever smoked weed you know that one hour can live like 10 years long <laughs> so stuff like this and i remember actually from my studies um the size of an animal changes its subjective experience of time so that in the eyes of a hummingbird. Yeah. We are all incredibly slow. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. And it it's moving along just normal. But that's what they're getting at here with uh, the morning glory does not differ at heart from the giant pine. Mm -hmm. Because it's still the perception, w w despite the relative differences between individual you know, animals and whatever, that perception itself is the same. It's just what is being perceived is different. And that difference is nominally unimportant for this subject. Yeah, I don't know if I completely buy it. I, I, I know what they are getting at about... Okay, let's imagine that you're supposed to, let's say, die at 30 years, right? And so you're living your life really fast, you know, to kind of like burn the same subjective amount of time as somebody who's going to live to 60. 
and then people invent some some drug that will prolong your life massively. And what now? You have already burned all life. Some well, there's there's a lot of factors in that. How does it extend your life? How have you been living up till now? Why are you dying at 30 instead of 60? These are all questions that have to be unpacked to really get to the root of that. Oh, that's mm -hmm. fair. That's fair. That's fair. Yeah, uh, that's right. I, I said a lot of things, and each of them is complicated. So yeah, let's let's not. That's a good point. Oof. But like, yeah. if you've got say an insect which doesn't really have many complicating outside factors, I I think I understand what you're saying is. Well, what if we made an, a bug medicine that made this insect live ten times longer? Would its subjective experience change? Mm -hmm. And in the paragraph after that little poem about the pine, it says that, okay, well, now that we can live longer, our experience sort of speeds up as we get older. And I've noticed this. I remember when I was eight years old, an hour felt like an eternity. And now an hour feels like just an hour. Yeah, like you would wake up in the morning before your parents are up and you just can't, like, survive, you know, all that infinite waiting until something starts happening. <laughs> right that's true and i'm sure that in another 20 years an hour is going to feel like five minutes to me mm -hmm. but for now it's just an hour and when i was a child it was just an hour but it, not only was it just an hour it was a whole hour <laughs> mm. but it is interesting how how it changes as you get older, because the more memory, I think this is it, I think the more memory you have logged, uh, the ratio gets heavier. So you've got one hour over the rest of your lifespan, and that's the ratio. Right. And, and every time you live another hour, that number on the bottom of the fraction gets a little bit bigger, which means the total number gets a little bit smaller. Um... You know, this also reminds me of what ended up being a bit of a sad YouTube video for me. <laughs> uh, where it Are you going to bring us all down? Uh, probably. Bring us down, this. Uh, Do it. Statistically speaking, for those people who, um, you know, maybe they they move out of their parents' house at, let's say, 20, right? Mm -hmm. um, at that point, or even starting, like, in middle school, you have logistically speaking with all of the many demands that life has on us so for those of us who are not like in exceptional or for circumstances like you're not being homeschooled you're not being xyz you're just going through like what's considered the standard of like i go to public school i have a couple of after school activities blah 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 starting at about middle schoolish time or even before you have a, a, a Quanti quant quantity wise spent the most amount of time with your parents that you will ha ever spend with them again hmm. um, over the course of the rest of your their lives or your life um, because you you just you have other obligations maybe you see them this often or that often but like if you just break it down into like hours or days you've already spent the most amount of time with them that you ever will makes sense and um so this this idea of this perception of things that like maybe that doesn't feel like that much time in comparison how much time you have left to do xyz but often <laughs> it just goes back to me like earlier things in the chapter where things don't exist outside of a comparison sometimes or the comparison yeah. makes them exist more real real than they did before um hey um, mm -hmm. I remember with my grandma, like, for my family, I'm basically going to be the one who will take care of the parents and the grandparents when they get older. Mm. I've just kind of decided that on my own. But I wouldn't necessarily say that'd be the prime time where you see most of your parents. But I would say it was, like, when you knew them in their prime before stuff happened and you know how we get older and our minds just kind of lose it? Well, because... that drops off in different ways at different ages, but I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, yeah. It's around 55, 60 
65 actually is the latest where your mental cognition starts to decline. But up until that point, it gets better. Mm -hmm. Reflexes, physical uh, skills, start to decline around 35, 40, which is great news for me. <laughs> That's because Max is old. I am so old. <laughs> so old. <laughs> but How in terms... I mean, uh, good news. What? How is it good news? I, I don't get that part. Oh, uh, that was the joke. Yeah, um, that was oh, that was okay. my sarcasm. Sarcasm. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's actually bad news. Okay. It's actually bad news. <laughs> <laughs> All yeah. right. I get it now. Okay. <laughs> it's the exact opposite of what you said. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah. it has a one. That's that Zen right there. See, it's, it brings itself with the opposite. Love it. Get us back on track, Des. We've we've all gotten lost. Um, I'm over here sniffing a dog foot. You? No, it smells Why? like Fritos. It smells like Fritos. That's so gross. <laughs> yeah, don't eat those Fritos. Don't eat the dog foot <laughs> either. No, it's for <laughs> sniffing, not not eating. Um, back on track is the discussion. of this analogy about how fish go swimming and they just keep swimming, just keep swimming. Oh boy. Just keep swimming. You and know, where, I where is that in the book? And... <laughs> Actually, it's right here. You um, gave Ellen a run for her money. <laughs> fish, the f a fish swims, he swims on and on and on. Right there. Oh my God. That's what it says. <laughs> Damn you, Dad. What are you trying to say? <laughs> and to the fish, there's no end to the water. The water is all like, and I just this. Ex oh gosh, my brain. This thing needs... starts. Okay, this thing starts that this fish swimming, 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 mm -hmm. and it ends with the fish, the water, and life. All three create each other. Yeah. So fish creates water. Water creates life. Life creates fish. Mm -hmm. And vice versa. Yeah. Much okay. better. Much better said than I was trying to do. Thank you. Ooh, I, good job. I'm oh. so tired. You have. And, and, I'm well, so sorry. Somehow, <laughs> somehow you get from the first one to the last one, and I got lost somewhere in the middle of it. But it's fine. This is using some interesting. I'm not even sure how to qualify it. It's mm -hmm. like sophomoric philosophy. Mm -hmm. yeah. It gets there, but it's it's an interesting setup. Not that there's anything wrong with it. It's just kind of loosey goosey. Yeah, I would agree. It's just suddenly some somehow like flips and like arrives at a conclusion, right? Uh, somehow randomly. And then uh, I think the sentence is a nice way of kind of maybe summarizing the the moral of the story perhaps or even just as a good example if you're trying to explain mindfulness to someone and that's not making where one is going so much more important than where one is that the whole yeah the, the the journey is the traveling not the destination yeah and i think that that um is kind is at least one lesson coming out of that long story about the fish right um, What's the fish's name? Nemo. Shut up. <laughs> Shut up. Dory. The fish Dory. is Dory. Everybody knows that finding Dory was super cute. <laughs> I brought this on myself. I'm sorry, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> the life of Zen begins, therefore, in a disillusion with the pursuit of goals. I mean, I love it. I understand it. I resonate with it. It's beautiful. It's just if I was a country at war, and I need I would to be very impressed to talk with you. Resources. What? 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 I would be very impressed to talk with you, a living country. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. I mean, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, yeah, of course, of course. But uh, <laughs> if I look at it from like the economic point of view, and like like all these things, right? Like when you say, okay, well, you know, why prolong people's life? Because it's just subjective. Well, no. They are not productive for the longest amount of time. And when they hit the productive edge, then you want to milk it 
as long as you can, yeah. you know, for, for improvement of the society, which you need because then you, you need to have military power to fight other societies because otherwise they take over, right? So from a point of from one point of view, one could say that like infecting a country with Zen would destroy it. How do you how do you reconcile that? Now I, I understand how horrible is it to like like switch from like beautiful Zen to all these things, right? But do you see the problem? Not gonna lie, I spaced out halfway in. <laughs> Never mind. I'm just saying that like. This works on the absolute sense where everything is one, mm -hmm. right? But as soon as you do any division, like between countries, then this thing breaks down. Oh well, yeah, mm -hmm. but that's because you've you've now made a distinction. Anytime there's a distinction, it it all breaks down. So mm -hmm. in that sense, it's very fragile. And now I heard some weird things. I think Focus was actually talking about it. That let's say let's say like. You know, Tibetans were actually quite like aggressive, and they controlled large amount of territory. But they also did Buddhism. But they would use the Buddhism. Uh, I I don't know if it's true or not, right? But but you can, for instance, think about all these ideas that like you know time doesn't matter. There's re reincarnation and stuff like that to essentially support like a military conquest. Because that's the sort of things you would want to think. Oh, and absolutely. Think, right? Absolutely. And, then, and then, then you flip it over and now it's like a big peaceful, you know, like like wonderful thing. Right? Get along. This and... is why... <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. It, it's just hard to reconcile, you know? This is why um, just, just teaching with words will never get the job done. Because words can easily be misinterpreted, be twisted. Um... The reason I think that this is even a, a practical solution, Zen, Buddhism, the whole thing, is that in truth, we are all already enlightened. That's why we can recognize it at all or potentially recognize it. If it were just one, you know, the Buddha got enlightened and we have to learn how to do it from him, we're all fucked. <laughs> but if we're all already enlightened, we've got it in there somewhere, and we just have to recognize it through, you know, various means or whatever. Um, these words are just guides, mm -hmm. and they're intended to lead us to that destination, which is already with us. But it's also like humans are clever, and sometimes too clever. So things like. Uh, the Lao Tzu book, um, the Tao Te Ching, mm -hmm. that can that can be used both as a guide for a ruler ruling a country in an effective, uh, you know, sort of good kind of way. It can also be used as a general, like a military leader, sort of guide. It it can be used as many things. It can be used just for running a business. But the way we interpret words, the way we want to construct them in our minds can vary significantly from person to person. Mm -hmm. And this, this, this ease of creating a dualism, of creating a this country versus that country to get back to your original point, is something that we have to be on constant guard about. And that's why uh, they hark on on all of this, you know, ah, duality, look out for duality, because, I mean, it could really fuck you up, like, honestly, if you don't keep an eye out for it, and you're trying to get into this, and you're trying to understand what it's all about, the single instance of dualistic thinking that you haven't noticed mm -hmm. can just topple the whole thing down. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I... Says. Yeah. So you've got a very good point there. Creepy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, by the way, as you are speaking, I was watching an emu trying to drink our window. <laughs> so, so yeah, the universe. Excellent. Is like, that's a lesson. <laughs> <laughs> so thirsty. Need that window, <laughs> yo. 
Um, yeah, that looks great. I really liked this little bit here. I think it did a good job of at least expressing a sensation I've had a little bit. I, I Not obviously, I think, to the full extent that somebody who's capable of making sayings that become famous <laughs> is. Um, before I had studied Zen for 30 years, I saw mountains as mountains and waters as waters. When I arrived at a more intimate knowledge, I came to the point where I saw that mountains are not mountains and waters are not waters. But now that I have got its very substance, I am at rest. For it's just that I see mountains once again as mountains and waters once again as waters. Yeah. And I, uh, yeah. One. Except I don't remember the waters. I think I heard a version of it's just the mountains. Yeah. The the, the meaning so is there. That, that, that's your experience. <laughs> yeah, a bit. I it reflects so a thought I was trying to express. Mountains as mountains? Huh? Have you seen mountains as not mountains? Yeah. Wow. I mean. Okay, that's it then. I don't that's know perfect. to what extent. I mean, I don't want to sit here and be like, I have once upon a time been enlightened. <laughs> I just uh, love it when you speak like that. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, you know, break out that podium. We kind of like like tear us down in a sense and whatever, but but you have to realize that we are in a wonderful position to actually get this, right? Like we have information, we have translations, we have the sangha, we have like like technology, we have everything. Mm -hmm. We have access to to hundreds of years of people thinking it through and like trying to express it more concisely and better and in many different angles right so mm -hmm. you know like this dude did it in 30 years you know <laughs> you can do it in three right well and then but uh, in can. the same breath uh, with all of those things that we have just as i was earlier in the chapter with some of these concepts i have obstacles now because i know more and i have more in my mind and so when i'm presented with these thoughts that in themselves are very simple i make them complicated <laughs> There's also a lot more shiny things these days. Ooh, shiny. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's a problem. But you're absolutely right. Um we could dedicate, say, three years to sincere, intense study, meditation, and contemplation. Mm -hmm. And you could come to a point where you just you get it. It all clicks in. Mm -hmm. So what's stopping you? Um, what's, what's stopping any of us? The what is it called? Fetters. Fetters, the right? Fetters, yes. That's right. Ducka and all of that. <laughs> um. Oh right, yeah. We have all these technology, but we have also fetters. We have way mm -hmm. more fetters. That's yeah. a good point. So while the path may be cleaned up a bit, you know, they've brushed off some of the gravel off the road for us. Mm -hmm. There's also so many more side businesses with bright flashing signs saying, hey, you don't have to go that way. Come on in here. And then the journey ends and you get distracted. And mm -hmm. Just go in some other place. Or you go window shopping for a bit, and then you're like, wait, wasn't I going somewhere? And then you're <laughs> lost, and you're like, hold on, where'd this street come from? <laughs> what is this? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I know for myself, I tend to have uh, special interests that linger for about two years, and then I move on to the next one. Mm -hmm. Buddhism was one such interest for me. And when I have a special interest, I tend to devote... Um, when compared with the average human, in an ordinary, in inordinately large amount of effort and time... You are it. outlier Otto. <laughs> yes. Mm. You know, the average person reads about one hour worth of uh, Buddhist materials a year. No, no, that's just Max. What? 
they make up for most of those hours for the average person. Okay, well, that's, that's okay. That's really interesting. This is really interesting. So you say this is over for you? My interest has waned. I'm okay. I'm not. It's not a special interest for me anymore. That's not to say I am entirely done with it. Clearly, here I am discussing, but um, I'm no longer. Shall we say Hyper, fixated on it? Hyperfixated, right. yeah. Yes. So what's the what's the new cool shiny thing that you're interested in then? Oh, um, gaming. It's, <laughs> it's stupid. I don't judge you. And Ducktales. No, Ducktales <laughs> is just in my brain in nah, the back that's, corner. That's oh. Avery's special interest right now. <laughs> yeah, it's just sitting there waiting at all times. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let's sing Ducktales at the end of the stream. <laughs> You just created a new tradition. All right. <laughs> um, but before I get too distracted about what I was saying, let me try and bring it back. In my uh, hyper-focus on this, it was... And like I don't... I want to be careful not to extrapolate what I did to say everyone can do this. But I think at least some people can do this. Um, it was relatively simple to go to certain source materials and not get like lost in the weeds of reading every sutra there is and learning all of the different steps to attain enlightenment and the different stages. No, no, no. I skipped all of that. And I said, let me just read about like the Eightfold Path, the Noble Truths, um, some of the patriarchs of certain fa like foundational uh, schools like Zen and mm -hmm. uh, Mahayana and all of that. I'll read some of the big sutras, the Heart Sutra, the Diamond Sutra, things like that. And then just with those, you can sort of connect the dots. And I mean, when you really get down to it, the sutras are all basically saying the same thing in different ways because mm -hmm. they have to. Hmm. So if you connect the dots and you see what they're all pointing at and you stop looking at the finger, you start looking at the moon, it just clicks. And then everything becomes a guide. You don't need to start referencing old sutras anymore. You can just look at a tree and be like, oh, yes, very Zen of you. Those leaves do wiggle in the wind, don't they? <laughs> and mm -hmm. like your own life starts becoming your teacher mm -hmm. and you start hearing an inner voice. Um, in Hinduism, it's called the Satguru, the inner guru, that tells you, or or points out, rather, oh, all of these different things that you would never have noticed otherwise. It's always been there. You just don't um, connect the dots. And at that point, that's when I stopped sort of digging in to the archive, to Buddhist doctrine and texts and all of that stuff, and started letting it just sort of come to me uh, as as a Zen master would on the mountain. It's just, ah, yes, the babbling of a brook. How serene. <laughs> and that's the whole experience. Mm -hmm. There's there's no, what will I have for dinner? No, it's just, I'm just here right now. You know, I think, I think yeah. everyone could, well, again, not everyone. Many people can do that. It's just, it's just really, I think, an issue of working up the the diligence um, to get over that initial hump mm -hmm. of going in, reading the sutras, connecting the dots is the essential key. Because if you just read a sutra and then you go ask someone, hey, what's this mean? And then they tell you that, you still haven't connected the dots. Even if they've connected them for you, you haven't done it. Mm-hmm. And that's, I think, where a lot of people fall down. They'll med meditate for 20 years, they'll read sutras, and they'll have an, like an intellectual understanding, just like what we were talking about earlier with, you know, we're all one because of the Big Bang. They'll get it in that way, and they'll be right, but they won't, like, get it, get it inside. It won't have that recognition. It'll just be an understanding. Mm. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. It reminds me there was uh, Feynman was saying exactly something like that about people who study physics memorizing words and what they mean. 
uh, versus what was it? There was some sort of luminescence when when you crush a crystal of sugar, you actually see a spark of light. Mm. And this is a, like a complicated Greek name, right? And so he says, well, the students are just learning this name, but the guy who actually goes home and takes a cube of sugar and crushes it in pliers and looks for that spark, right? They get that, right? They're actually doing an experiment. They're actually realizing that the physics is connected to the world around them, right? And that makes the difference. It's the difference between seeing a lake and jumping into it, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, that, yeah. Because if you see it, yeah, you get it. It's a lake. But you jump into it, you really get it. You're wet now. You're in the lake. <laughs> yeah. I think I think you're onto something with that. Yeah, that's cool. Also, that's cool about the sugar crystal thing. I kind of want to go do that now. Yeah, <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> to the, uh, it was it was uh, I, uh, the book was surely you're joking, Mister Feynman. I think, and I'll, uh, you'll probably find this little quote online somewhere. Yeah, try it. I have, I've never tried it. I, I, I'm the first kind of a student. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell me about it? And first thing is like, all right, where's the sugar? Let's go. Come on. Let's go. <laughs> I guess you have to crush it just right, and it has to be really dark. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Good job. Yeah. Oh, one more thing. Um. I'm not sure if there was the part about the three pounds of flags here or not. No. It was not, not. I don't think so. Okay, never mind. Where did I see it then? Never mind. Never mind. Don't think it was in this section. Um, good job, team. Next time we'll be wait, talking about sick quality. Was that another. a poem about the sun? Did you skip the poem about the, uh, the Tao? It was Never about mind. the Tao, not the sun. It's just the Tao. It's basically the same poem. <laughs> yes. It's true. Um, I don't think there was a poem about the sun in this No, that's, that's not in this book. It's just, again, when I got into that deep stuff, like it all sort of munged together into one. Here's Buddhist stuff, I, like go. in my brain. Yeah. Yeah. Vibe. <laughs> To its accomplishments, it lays no claim. It loves and nourishes all things, but does not lord it over them. The Tao, without doing anything, leaves nothing undone. That's that good shit right there. Cool beans. <laughs>